think you would see me on a Tuesday. Red button means we're live. Some casual takes episode 63, hosted by your boy, Stephen Pepper, here to casually talk sports. This episode is brought to you by No One. Happy Halloween, October 31st, everyone. Everyone be safe out there. I know most people watch me are college students, so be safe tonight. Enjoy some candy. It is Halloween. Relax. Maybe give up that diet just for like two minutes of an M&M, okay? Tuesday episode, you're probably thinking, why am I here on a Tuesday? I've done Tuesday episodes before, but that's when I have to push back the Monday episode. But I gave you guys a Monday episode yesterday, so why am I here on a Tuesday? Well, I want to start doing more Tuesday episodes. I want to start including more episodes other than just the Monday and Friday when I have time. Because like you guys know, I do this podcast, although I want to produce a podcast that's listenable and a lot of people listen to my takes and enjoy and learn more about sports and have a good time listening to me and on on a good podcast. But primarily this podcast is a place for me to practice and get more reps and to find my voice as someone who wants to work in sports media someday. But the only way I can get more reps is by increasing the amount of episodes I do. So I want to do at least three episodes a week, two to three. And whenever I can find time, Tuesday looks like the best spot because I think my more, I do have, I, I do have a lot of classes on Tuesday, but I can find some time like I did today uh, there's Monday Night Football on tu- uh, I can talk about on Tuesdays. The NBA season just started, so there's going to be games I can talk about. Plus, what perfect fitting to get the first Monday, Tuesday back-to-back show with the James Harden trade that we are going to talk about that broke um, at night. Oh, my HDMI. Sorry, my HDMI kind of started tripping. So we're going to talk about the Harden trade to the Clippers. We're also going to talk about Monday Night Football, like I just said. And then the Lakers game, as we always do. It would be great if Lakers games were on Mondays and we can talk about that. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in who's here on this emergency stream, I guess, post-Harden on a Tuesday. I did not see this James Harden trade coming to the Clippers. Well, I did, but I'll get that in a second. First of all, 3 m deal on Halloween. Spooky, crazy things happen on Halloween. That's what they said, and this is what we got. I went to bed last night relatively early. I uh, like 1.30. I could have been went, went to bed way earlier, but I stayed up to watch the Lakers game. West Coast games always run late. Went to bed kind of stressed, but the Lakers won. So I went to bed. Didn't think anything was going to happen. I know the 76ers did play like the night before, but then boom. Hard and trade at 2.30, an hour after I go to sleep. I wake up ready for class. You know, you rub your eyes. You go brush your teeth. You go take your morning piss. I flip on my phone to check my social media as I do every morning. I got eight notifications, three text messages from friends, Woj Twitter bombs that James Harden went to the Clippers. Now, I thought this, I thought James Harden was going to end up getting traded, possibly Chicago, possibly the, still the Clippers, but not at this point in the season. If he wasn't going to get traded in the offseason, I thought this was going to be a deadline move because obviously Harden requested a trade in the offseason. He resigned. Uh, he took his extension of that player option to get traded. And then the team, Daryl Morey, doesn't like him. He's in the clubs with signs saying uh, Daryl Morey's a liar. He's doing media tours calling Daryl Morey a liar. Um, And then Daryl Morey said, okay, I don't really like you anymore. You're not allowed to show up. We're going to deny you access to our plane on road trips, and he's not playing at home games. So the writing was on the wall, but I thought this was going to be like a deadline move. Harden just sits out or finally plays like two games for the deadline. But it happened, and we got the Clippers getting James Harden, P.J. Tucker, and honestly, I can't pronounce this third guy's name. He's not really that relevant. Philip, like, Petrovez. I'm sorry, that's disrespectful. But And the 76ers are in return for giving up James Harden and P.J. Tucker. Basically, get Robert Covington, Nicholas Batum, Marcus Morris, Kenyon Martin Jr., 2028 unprotected first-round pick, two second-round picks, and a 2029 pick swap. Now, the funny – best things about trades – especially when big teams form, is that all the sports media sites are like, who's stopping them? New big three, new super team in town. But there is some pushback that I'm seeing on social media from people who are saying, why did the Clippers do this? And I got to say, don't overthink it, okay? (laughs) The Clippers fleece the 76ers. Stop it. Don't overthink it. Everyone's trying to be smart, overanalyzing, and pointing out in their bench. Chill out. What Harden will bring to this team is miles more significant than what Robert Covington, Nicholas Batum, Marcus Morris could ever do. Harden is a mile, like Harden led the league in assists last year. He's 20 and 10 guy. That's what Harden could bring to this team. A playmaker, an extra scorer, a vet. Like, come on, Batum, guys, are you serious? Listen, the West has gotten better by the year since the Clippers acquired the duo, and all the Clippers have been is praying their duo's healthy, and they added a Russell Westbrook. They needed this Harden trade. 
it's like the Clippers gave up. Everyone's freaking out about their bench. Let's stop acting like the Clippers gave up significant role players. Batum, Covington, Morris, Martin, they're not contributing much to this team. Their actual role players, Terrence Mann, Bones, Highland, Plumlee, are still on the squad. Now, Then you insert a P.J. Tucker to be a role player as well. Then you put James Harden on top of that. Like Those guys are waiver players in fantasy basketball. Fourth quarter, why the Batum in? You stressing over that? Those guys are bag of chips. That's what they got. They got a bag of chips for James Harden. I've seen the Nuggets win a championship with a tight rotation of a bunch of C guys. Playoff basketball is all about who's your starting five, and you got one or two guys coming off the bench. That's it. You tighten the rotation in playoff basketball. You play maybe you know, maybe it's an eight-man rotation. That's it. Boston Celtics, they have one or two guys off the bench. That's it. And look at them. They're like one of the best teams in basketball. Stop freaking out about depth. Same with the Suns. Once they get healthy, stop flipping out about depth. And then the draft picks, too. I get the six, the 76 or like the draft picks, right? Do you think Steve Ballmer is losing sleep over a few draft picks? The Clippers are already so all in. I think a few draft picks aren't going to do any damage to them. Like, they're so deep in the cap. And especially that Paul George trade and the Westbrooks and all, all the stuff that they've been adding, they have no draft picks left. They're going all in to win. There's no going back for them. So they had to make this trade. And what Harden also does that a lot of people aren't talking about is he adds a higher floor to this team because for back-to-back postseasons, the duo Paul George, Kawhi Leonard have been haven't played majority of those two ga- majority of postseason games. So James Harden, if one or both don't play in the postseason, him and Westbrook and their collection of role players can give him a better chance of winning. It just has a safety level of floor. Maybe Kawhi doesn't play for. 20 games. Paul George has a knee injury. Westbrook's out for a little bit. Paul James Harden gives him much more of a floor than Batum ever would. Now, I get it. The fit of Westbrook and Harden's not ideal. We've seen it multiple times. I don't really like it, too, especially today. It's maybe like 2016. This could have been cool, but in, in 2023, you're talking about two guys who are clearly declining. Still good guys. Westbrook plays his heart out. Harden's a 20 and 10 guy. It's still not ideal. High turnover. Both playmakers, both trying to be that third score on the team. So Ty has got to figure out the rotation. But I mean, you can do a lineup of, we've seen Westbrook come off the bench for the Clippers at, at the beginning of his Clipper tenure. Now he starts. We've seen Westbrook come off the bench for the Lakers. I think Ty Lue can kind of get Westbrook off the bench. I would want to. I wouldn't want Harden and Westbrook playing at the same time. I would say have a James Harden point guard, uh, then Paul George at the two, Kawhi, then a P.J. Tucker, Zubac. That would be my starting five. Then off the bench, I would have Russell Westbrook, Norman Powell. I forgot. Norman Powell is also a great – that's a six-man-of-the-year type candidate right there. Terrence Mann, and then Plumlee for big man backup minutes. And that's it. Everyone else just doesn't play. Like, why are we stressing about this? Now, for the Sixers, when I say they got fleeced, I still think the 76ers are a really good team. I think the Sixers are a good team. Um, we've seen this season close game against Milwaukee and beads playing at MVP level. Tyrus Max, who, who I regret not picking for most improved. I pick about Austin Reeves. I'm going to talk about him in a second. Max, is coming alive, coming to his own. Thanks to Harden not being there. Ubre is a solid piece. He's shown himself. Tobias Harris is still there. They have some, like Morris Batum. You know, these guys aren't bad. Kenny Martin Jr., these guys aren't bad. I'd say Philly, I didn't think they get substantially better, but they got quality role players to go behind. They're two guys. But all in all, the 76ers, they're okay. They're a bit better off. Still don't think this is a finals team, but they get some quality role players for a guy who's just never going to play. Kind of wish they got like a Terrence Mann or at least a Norman Powell in this deal because then I'd start feeling a little bit better than Philly. But the Clippers fleece them. They get James Harden. Now, I'm not going to say the Clippers are a title team yet because I'm more of a see-it-believe-it type guy. I need to see how this team chemistry works and if these guys stay healthy. But the Clippers got to be feeling really good today because that was a – that was a good trade for them. Sorry, my nose. Is... The temperature's changing. It's like 40 degrees uh, here in Ohio. Let's talk Monday Night Football now. The Detroit Lions hosted it. They beat the Las Vegas Raiders 26-14. to 14. Now, when I say 26-14, to 14, it doesn't look like a commanding victory for a team in the Detroit Lions that a lot of people are so high on, including myself, and a Las Vegas Raiders team that a lot of people are very low on. It doesn't look like a commanding victory, but chill out. 20, first of all, 26 to 14 is a that's a pretty good win. That's a that's a pretty good win. I just seen the Raiders 
and the Ravens win by a touchdown to a Cardinals team that just benched their quarterback because of that performance. You can't blow teams out by 30 points every game when you're more talented than the other. But in reality, you watch the tape, just don't look at that ESPN notification for the score. The game felt more like a 35-7 to Lions victory because the Lions were up and down the field the entire game. They had nearly 500 total yards of offense in that dome, 29 first downs, 17 of 15 on third and fourth down, and almost 20 more minutes of time possession than the Raiders. And they held the Raiders to one offensive touchdown and only had one good drive on offense. The Lions, the only reason why, like, that's the only reason why it was 26 to 14. They had a pick six. They had two fumbles. One was in the red zone, and they missed a field goal. So that that clearly could have been like a 35 to 7 game if they played a bit of a neater game. The Lions right now look like one of the premier teams in the National Football League. And it's it's crazy for me to say it because I'm almost 21 years old and I've never ever been in a position where the Detroit Lions have I can say the Detroit Lions are the, one of the premier teams in the National Football League. Detroit Lions are the two seed in the NFC. I don't think I've ever said that. Look, they had a couple good years with Matt Stafford. I think they made the playoffs twice in my lifetime. They had a couple good years with Matt Stafford, but those years were like one and done, getting the wild card and lose years. That's it. But they're one of the premier teams in the league. Like, this Lions seems legit. Like, the, the Lions have been rebuilding for my entire life. But now we're seeing the Lions enter one of the premier teams in the league. I think the NFL, I think the rest of the NFL teams that are currently rebuilding should take notes. Because I think what how the Lions rebuilt is, because I think the Lions, how they rebuilt is the example of how teams should rebuild. There's multiple steps that you need to do to rebuild teams. I think the Lions, they knocked out two steps in one. First of all, to rebuild, you kind of got to understand that a chapter is has closed in your franchise. You have to understand when to rebuild. So when a chapter is closed, you got to rebuild, you got to move on, ship any valuable assets you have. The Lions had Matthew Stafford, so they traded him. But they also in that Matthew Stafford trade knocked out the second step, which is get the quarterback right. Now say what you want about Jared Goff, Jared Goff is really good. He wins games, especially at home. So they got they traded Matthew Stafford for Jared Goff. They didn't have to be number 1 and draft a quarterback. Unlike Denver, remember the Broncos are trying to rebuild. They traded for Russell Wilson, so they try to get their quarterback right, but they had to give up a lot of picks in return. The Lions got picks in return with their quarterback, and those picks turned into Jameer Gibbs, Sam Laporta, and Jameson Williams, who you kind of cross your fingers that he's going to pop, but a lot of people still believe he's going to pop. He still has time. He's been injured and suspended, so let him have time to develop. But those are really good draft picks they turned those guys into. The third step is do your scouting homework and hit home runs in the draft. And it's clear last night that the Lions, these Lions draft picks for the last like two to three years are really, really starting to get going. And they hit them in the key positions too. Talk about you need, I feel like offenses need one or two really great skill guys. Jameer Gibbs is turning into one of the best running backs in the league. And they got a home run, absolutely, and getting in the fourth round, a mod round St. Brown, a top 15 wide receiver. And you got a draft line of scrimmage. It's 2023. Think of the best teams in the NFL. 49ers, um, Ravens, Eagles, line of scrimmage, offense, defensive line. The Lions have one of the best run-blocking offensive lines in the sport. And their defensive line of an Aiden Hutchinson got six sacks last night. Think about Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs have at 187 total, 189, sorry, yards of scrimmage. Receiving and rushing with one touchdown. He looked excellent. We were waiting for Jameer Gibbs to pop. I remember when I talked about that first game, uh, his first game against the Chiefs, we came on, I came on here and talked about it. I said, Jameer Gibbs needs to get out of this snap count bull crap. He's better than Montgomery. Montgomery's still valuable, but Jameer Gibbs' his speed, his vision, his outside running, his receiving upside, it's so dynamic. If you're going to take a guy, I think I, I think you believe he went at like 12 you got to use a Jameer Gibbs, and it showed. Dan Campbell said his breakout was going to come, and it came last night. I'm on Ross St. Brown, man. Three straight games with 100 yards. He's a home run. Sam Laporta already, that's a Pro Bowl tight end right there. He got a Pro Bowl tight end in his rookie season. He had a touchdown last night. And the last thing is you got to get a head coach that has guys bought into the rebuild and the culture shift. 
You need a culture setter, setter head coach, and that's Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell, Dan Campbell wasn't a star NFL player. This is a tight ends coach, but he knows the line of scrimmage. He knows how valuable running the football is. Dan Campbell, I knew he was going to be the, the their guy when he cried for the team in his opening presser. That's a guy that you would run through a wall for. Like if Dan Campbell told me to enlist in the Army, oh my God, go ahead, I'd do it. Like, that's a guy who I want to play for. That's a guy, like, if he was coaching, like, my son, if I had a son in the future, coach my son's, like, Pee Wee football team. Like, that's a dude who can motivate some men. Football coach should be able to motivate men, especially when you're rebuilding. D'Amico Ryans is doing an excellent, excellent job as a leader in tech in Houston. When you're rebuilding, you need to be able to have a head coach that has the guys and has the organization bought in to a new culture, or else you're going to be firing that coach while you're rebuilding, set your team back another year or so. That's what the Detroit Lions are. Like when I, when I watched them last night, I see a team that has done an excellent, excellent job at rebuilding and they just done everything right. Moving off their assets, getting the quarterback, hitting home runs in the draft and finding the coach. And right now they said it's six and two. I believe they're the number two seed in the NFC they have, I think, the easiest schedule remaining in the NFL. I said preseason. A lot of people are on this Detroit Lions team being a 13, 14, maybe even win team. I said pump the brakes. This is like a 10, 11 win team. I, I, I'm, I'm looking wrong. I should have joined everyone's bandwagon. This team can clearly win 13 games. They have an easy schedule, and they're that good. And I thought this team was just going to host one playoff game. This team could host two playoff games in Detroit. They keep winning out, and we could be talking about this team. I don't think it's a Super Bowl team yet. I think Goff could still Goff. We saw pick six last night. But, I mean, this team could be a dark horse. Not even a dark horse. This team could easily be in the NFC Championship game, especially when the 49ers and Cowboys are kind of falling here and there. And we talk about their division. Kirk Cousins, unfortunate Achilles injury. Jordan Love looks like a backup. Sorry, cry. And Chicago Bears, Tyson Badgett. This division's locked up. It's it's a runaway. They're going to get a lot of wins. Shout out to Detroit, man. I've never thought I could say this in my life. I've been watching football for over a decade, been alive for like 20, almost 21 years, and I've never seen Detroit Lions seem this good. This is what Cleveland is. This is what Cleveland is like close to. Cleveland, I think, I don't know if I'm 100% sold on Stefanski, but Cleveland had a coach of the year. Cleveland's organization is much smarter. He had a lot of home runs in the draft. It's just the it's just the quarterback part is where Cleveland is kind of messing up it. Uh, Baker Mayfield, they moved off him, and then they try to get Deshaun Watson. Cleveland's also done an excellent job of hitting the same rebuild path as Detroit. It's just that quarterback situation. Like if Cleveland had Goff today, you would be talking about Cleveland as one of the premier teams in the AFC. But of course, same with the Jets. The Jets have done the same thing. Coach Robert Sala, that's a man in the locker room. Skill position, home runs in the draft, defensive, offensive line. They try to get Rodgers. It's just the Jets would also be in the same conversation. That's how you rebuild in the National Football League. Atlanta Falcons, you know, they got to get a quarterback. They're hitting some nice players in the draft. They need to get the quarterback right. You need to get those four steps, and that's how you rebuild. And for the Raiders, let's talk about the Raiders for a second. Listen, what an awful game for the Raiders. Like, why does this team have, like, I get they have a huge fan base, but, like, four primetime games for the Raiders this year? I think I've seen, like, a couple Sunday night, a couple Monday night footballs. Like, oh, like, ah, oh, I got to sit through this? It was just an awful game for the Raiders. Like, they have they have skill position guys like Adams and Jacobs. I don't understand why this team isn't putting up at least 21 points a game. So the lowest scoring offense is in the league. And last night, like I said earlier, they had one good drive, and it was led by Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs had to like carry the Raiders offense and they had one good drive and mostly because it was Jimmy G. Jimmy G was absolutely pathetic. Last night, Jimmy G cooked up 10 completions, 10 completions for 21, uh, 21 attempts, 126 yards and interception got sacks six times. He also had no completions. Did you guys notice to a wide receiver in the first half? And it was clear after the game that Devontae Adams was frustrated. He slammed his helmet down. He was cursing up a storm on the sideline and was saying some, you know, questionable things in the locker room to the media. He doesn't want to play with Jimmy G. He absolutely hates Jimmy G. Like, it's clear. Jimmy G, I had Devontae Adams in fantasy. I had to move off him. Thank God I did. I had Jimmy G and I had Devontae Adams in fantasy. Whenever Jimmy G played, it was like 
Devontae Adams could never get the ball and had his worst games of the year. But whenever like Brian Hoyer would play or someone else other than Jimmy G, Jimmy G out due to injury, Devontae Adams would have his best games. Jimmy G never gives him touches. One catch on 11 targets. And it's not like Devontae Adams did have one drop. But then what? If he catches that, that's two catches on 11 targets. Big deal. And it would have been for like 10 more yards. He has one game this whole season over 100 yards. It's week eight. This is one of the best receivers in all football still. Jimmy G missed – this is where I was like, all right, dude, you got to start thinking about Aiden O'Connell because Jimmy G had two bombs. Like the Raiders, although it was a 12-point game, they had the ball back with like five minutes to go. They hit a quick touchdown. Okay, different ball game. Six, five-point game. Like five-point game, different ball game. Jimmy G misses two bombs. He had two chances to throw a deep bomb to Devontae Adams, who was wide open overthrew him out of bounds and overthrew him down the field twice. And then he had an end zone shot to Devontae Adams early in the game. Raiders recovered a fumble, gave the offense a great chance to score one play in intended target for Adams and was interception. Jimmy G, by the way, nine picks all year, had a bye week, was out for injuries, still leading the league. Like Devontae Adams, he came to the Raiders for Derek Carr. He came to the Raiders for Derek Carr, his Fresno State, his his buddy, his friend, now he's gone. So now we heard his comments a couple weeks ago. All he cares about is his performance rather than the Raiders winning. He aspires for greatness. He aspires for stats, all pros, Hall of Fame votes, not the Raiders making the playoffs. I know the reports today, the NFL trade deadline, I believe, is at 4 p.m. Eastern. And I know the reports, Schefter came on Monday Night Football last night, talked about it, and that's been the reports all week that the Raiders are not wanting to trade him despite, you know, Devontae Adams disgruntled. But if you're the Chiefs, I understand it's within division, but the Chiefs should try everything to pull off a Devontae Adams trade before the deadline. Like the Kansas City Chiefs desperately need a wide receiver. Desperately need a wide receiver. That's what's holding this team back. They're six and two right now, so it's not like, oh, freaking out about the Chiefs. But this team needs a wide receiver. This team has no one other than Travis Kelsey. That loss to the Broncos has to be a wake up call. They lost to the Broncos. I know Mahomes had interceptions. They were turning the ball over. They have a wide receiver. They beat the Broncos. <laughs> Their receivers can either not catch, get open, or hold on to the ball. Sky Moore, 20, it was 21 to nine. Mahomes had plenty of time. 21 to nine. I kept telling my friends who were betting on the Chiefs, I was like, dude, it's 21 to 9. I don't care. I've seen this movie way too many times before. That means Patrick Mahomes. Other than Brady, who 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 has a better chance of coming back and winning a football game? Mahomes dialed up a wide open touchdown pass to Sky Moore. He dropped it. The receivers also can't get open. Mahomes has to extend every play just to find a window for his receivers. And then he had a receiver in um, McCole Hartman, muff a punt. He had MVS, I believe who it was, fumbled the ball off a catch. That's who his receivers are. The Chiefs were 1-5 in, in the red zone against the Denver Broncos. I know the Broncos' defense is playing a bit better today, and but that's still the same defense that had 70 allowed on them, okay? If the Chiefs double-team, like if a team, an opponent double-teams Travis Kelsey, who does Mahomes have as a go-to, especially on third down in the red zone? I think teams now should start just double-teaming Kelsey because, okay, you're going to trust Sky more in the red zone. That loss of Juju Smith-Schuster is looking huge. Guys, who did Patrick Mahomes throw to on that key play that iced the Super Bowl? Juju Smith-Schuster in the red zone. I'm not like, I'm not asking. Okay, I am asking for like uh, Devontae Adams. But even if they get like a – I don't think the Broncos would want to treat in division either. But like a Judy, just like a B wide receiver, this team I would pick them to win the, win the AFC. But go in all in for Adams. I saw 49ers get CMC at the deadline and from within conference from Carolina, and look what that's working for them. He's got like 18 straight games with a touchdown. Rich got richer. Mahomes, he's not having his best season. I mean, 23.5 points per game this offense is. That's by far the lowest of Mahomes' career, his lowest yards per throw, and his ratings are in the dump. Um, he forced interception yesterday to Kelsey because he doesn't have receivers. I know Adams is a little bit of a diva. He cares more about his stats than wins. But you're going to get the best of both worlds if you play with Patrick Mahomes.
Patrick Mahomes will get you the wins. He get you Super Bowls, and you'll have a lot of stats because if teams can't double team Kelsey anymore, if Devontae Adams is lined up outside, I get the Raiders probably won't trade. Uh, Devontae Adams, I think Devontae Adams is still on their timeline, especially if it's going to go to Kansas City. They won't do that. But if I'm Kansas City, I'm making some phone calls. I'm calling up the Raiders right now before the 4 o'clock deadline. I'd give up a lot. I, I, I'd I absolutely give up a lot. I, I, I would give up a lot. I know they're strapped for cash because they got a lot of money in Kelsey, Mahomes, Chris Jones. But you need a receiver. You, you absolutely need a receiver. I would try to figure out a way to get a Devontae Adams or a receiver at the deadline. But what amazing would it be if Devontae Adams went to the Chiefs? Chiefs would be unstoppable. Okay, last topic today. Let's talk about my LeBron James-led Los Angeles Lakers. What a show today has been. Tuesday, I got a lot of good energy today on Tuesday. I'm awake. I'm up early. Went to class. I'm chilling. Great energy today on Tuesday. So the Lakers at home, Los Angeles, barely escaped the Orlando Magic. Watched all of it last night. Almost lost. I, I can't believe I thought this was our gimme game. Magic are a solid team. Don't get me wrong. They're a solid team. They started the season off 2-0. 2-0 doesn't really mean anything. But a lot of people had them as pushing like a playing team. Kind of like this is like the year where they start pushing for playoff contention. A lot of people had them in the playoffs because Franz Wagner, they're young players. Paolo, they take that leap. That's what a lot of people saw. So I'm not saying like this would have been a bad loss, but given where the Lakers are at, they needed to win this game, and thankfully they did. And to Lakers fans out there, you guys see the jersey, um, the, the po- like To Lakers fans out there, I'm talking to you guys from a LeBron fan. Brace yourselves, Lakers fans. It's going to be a long and stressful 82 game season. The Lakers are two and two, but like a Suggs three away and a Suns health, they're like a Suggs shot away and Suns health away from possibly an own four. The Lakers, the Lakers are fine. Like they still have a championship level ceiling, but they have this issue that I see that will prevent them from having a dominant regular season unless it improves. Like this issue will prevent the Lakers from blowing teams out. I think the Lakers are going to be close games every single night and consistently beating the best teams in the NBA. So I think the, you know, a lot of people have the Lakers as a top two to four seed in the West. I'd seen the Lakers might finish like five to six. Not a playing team. I think they're good enough not to be a playing team. But with this issue, if this doesn't get solved quick, they could kind of, you know, be like a little last year where they have a slow start to the season, but then they really start picking up at the end. And the issue isn't on Darvin Ham. It's this. Ever since LeBron has become a Laker, the Lakers' biggest issue has been the inability to hit threes and the inability to prevent opponents from making theirs. The Lakers, LeBron joined in 2018. So from 2018 to 2023, here's the Lakers' three-point percentage by year. 29th, 21st, the year they won the title. 22nd, 22nd. 24th, the year they win the conference finals, and now 28th this year. It's the complete opposite of their opponent's field goal three-point percentage. Second worst, second worst, fourth worst. Okay, 17th worst, not bad. Oh, then dead last the following year. 22nd worst this year, which isn't horrible. But last night we saw the Magic hit six more threes than the Lakers. The Lakers shot below 30% from three. They went well, like the Lakers rarely win the three point battle. That cannot happen in 2023. The Magic getting six more threes in the Lakers, six times three, ladies and gentlemen, do the math. That's 18 points. That's an 18 point swing. And for a long time, and for a long time, the Magic had seven, eight, nine more three pointers than the Lakers. The Lakers were well below into the 20s for a large stretch of the game. It looks a little bit better. Because what saved the Lakers at the end of the game was, was their ability to hit threes. LeBron hit one, D'Lo hit one, and the Magic missed a couple. That's why the Magic still hit 40% from three. The Lakers shot 29%. They rarely win three-point battles. When they do, it's like, oh, my God. You need to win three-point battles. It's 2023 basketball. You need to be able to make threes and not have your opponent hit more than you. That's it. You can't be shooting less than more than 10% less from three than your opponent. Like, the Lakers need to be able to shoot in LeBron's regression year. LeBron last night, LeBron's still good. He's still elite driver to the basket, elite downhill player. But the jump shot's not quite there. You can tell LeBron James is turning the ball over. He's not as fast. He's not going to jump out and score 30 a night. That, that day's behind LeBron's over. 
So the Lakers need their supporting cast to shoot behind him when LeBron does pass the basketball and when he's off the court, like Austin Reeves. I'm still waiting on Reeves. He was my most improved pick, but he kind of needs to clock in. What was he, one for 12 against the Kings? That's absolutely unacceptable. We talked about that yesterday. And then he was five for 12, a bit better, five for 12, but that's not, that's not you know, 50%. Last night, barely 40, 11 points, one for four from three. This dude was like a 50, 40, 90 type guy against the Denver Nuggets in the playoffs, averaging 21 points per game, hitting so many three-pointers, especially clutch ones. Need Reeves to step up, especially in LeBron when LeBron James is regressing like this. Um, same with a Vincent. He hit a three. Need Radish, need, need Wood, need Prince to knock down their threes. But I think the Lakers will figure it out. Remember last year, started two and ten, had like the worst three-point team start in NBA history. They'll be able to smooth it out. They'll be able to shoot better throughout the season. I don't think it'll be substantially better to where they'll start winning more, more, and more and more three-point contests. But I think they'll be a bit better than where they are now. I'm just like not. I was texting my buddy last night. I'm just not used to this as a LeBron James fan because you know, think about LeBron James's teammates when he was in Cleveland and they like his first hit in Cleveland. His last couple of years where they were like the one or two seed, they were winning 50 to 60 games. They had some of the league's best shooting in the regular season. And Miami, Battier, Ray Allen, Mike Miller in like six, seven threes in the finals. When I was growing when I like my favorite teams were the Cleveland teams, because I'm from Ohio. So like those Cleveland teams, J.R. Smith, Channing Fry, the, the Cleveland teams were constantly setting records in the regular season, postseason for like single game three-point records. It also helps when like Kevin Love and Kyrie could shoot. Anthony Davis and LeBron can't shoot, and that that doesn't help at all. And then we got a bunch of role players who are inconsistent shooters. Shooters, mind you, they shoot like 40%, and then they come to the Lakers, and then they can't can't hit crap. It, it's weird. I was texting my friend. It's like, dude, we used to have so much fun watching the Cavs hit like 33s a game in a postseason. Now the Lakers can barely hit 10, and they have to be in tight games with the Magic. That's just what the story of LeBron's Lakers tenure has been. The Lakers can hit threes, and they can't stop their opponents from hitting threes. Somehow they won a title. Somehow they won the title. They won the title with the second highest opponent three-point percentage in the league. That's insane. But I got nothing else for you guys. I got a class at 115, so I'm going to get up out of here so I can hustle a class and get up out your way. I appreciate the people who tuned in and will be watching Tuesday's episode. Next show will be on Friday around the top of the afternoon, just in case, or if you want to follow more, um, follow my social medias for clips, highlights, updates, social media, some casual takes, all platforms. Till Friday, I'll see you guys. Peace.